Hello. I'm going to play for you another video that is made by this MD, PhD, Linnea Boyev. She, in this video, is talking to her class about receptors. In the nervous system chapter, we're gonna talk about uh, how we have neurotransmitters and we have receptors that have to be shaped a certain way in order to respond to the, the neurotransmitters. And this uh, relatively simple video that she made, I think illustrates this beautifully. And so we're gonna take advantage of that. Some of it goes a little bit slowly, so I will speed it up uh, so you don't have to listen to it too slowly. And let's make sure that. Uh, yeah. Today I'm going to talk about direct acting agonists and antagonists uh, and how we know what a particular drug or we predict what a particular drug is going to do. All right, and I've used my third grade uh, art skills to make us some lovely visual aids and uh, let's get to it. Now, the receptor. A receptor is quite is like an enzyme in that a receptor is a protein and the protein function is determined by its structure. Uh, now, uh, I see a lot of students getting confused about the idea of an enzyme versus a receptor. So let me just review really quickly what an enzyme is. An enzyme is a protein which has an effect on its substrate. Okay, so I always draw enzymes sort of as Pac-Man because I like to think of them, especially the ones that chew things up. Uh, so what an enzyme does is it takes a substrate, it changes it in some way, then the substrate leaves and the enzyme binds another substrate and that repeats over and over again. So a nice example of that uh, that we're going to see very soon here is the substrate acetylcholine. So acetylcholine uh, is broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase. And what that enzyme does is when acetylcholine binds it, it breaks it into two pieces, namely it breaks it into acetate and choline. Right? And so the enzyme is a big protein that has a binding site that the substrate binds, and then the enzyme changes the substrate. Now that's a different situation than what we have with the receptor. In the receptor situation, or the situation with the receptor, uh, you have, instead of enzyme and substrate, the terms that we use are ligand and receptor. And what happens here is the ligand binds the receptor, okay? And then something happens. So what I've, I've shown here. For our purposes, um, the ligand that we're gonna be talking about it is a neurotransmitter. And each neurotransmitter has receptors that are shaped just so and can only bind that one neurotransmitter. As yay, uh, can be opening an ion channel. It can be signaling a G protein, which makes something else happen. It might increase the rate of some other um, molecules production, or it might do cyclic AMP business or something like that. But the, hopefully you can see the big difference here is that whereas an enzyme changes its, its substrate, a ligand binds the receptor and causes something to happen. So the receptor itself changes in such a way that something else happens in the cell. Now, as with an enzyme and its substrate, the ligand and the receptor stick together truly like a key in a lock. There truly is a part of the ligand which binds into the receptor because of its three-dimensional structure, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool. Okay, when I talk about ligands, I'm referring to the natural neurotransmitter or the natural hormone, the thing that's already in your body, the natural thing that binds that receptor. Okay, So estrogen binds it, is the ligand for the estrogen receptor, or thyroid hormone is the ligand for the thyroid hormone receptor, or adrenaline or epinephrine uh, binds an epinephrine or an adrenergic receptor. All right, so each of the hormones and signaling molecules in your body that have an action, they're usually through the binding of a receptor, which has the shape that it just binds perfectly. Okay. Now, when we talk about drugs, we're going to want to do one of two things. We're either going to want to mimic the action of the ligand, or we're going to want to or block the normal action of the ligand. All right. So let's have an example of something you hopefully know about just from regular life and not necessarily from classwork. Is you know that testosterone is a male hormone that causes men to have, causes quite a lot of different uh, physiologic changes in men. One of the things is it can do is it can help them grow a mustache. All right. So let's assume that uh, we have some testosterone and it's going to bind the testosterone receptor, which is often called the androgen receptor. It's going to bind that receptor and the site of action uh, for a hormone that's going to make you have a mustache will be your upper lip, right? And it'll, in fact, it'll be the follicles of the hairs on your upper lip, right? So testosterone makes its way to the hair follicles through the bloodstream, and then it eventually gets to those hair follicles, enters the cell, and it's bound to a receptor. And when it does, something happens, and in this case, it would be uh, that you grow a mustache, okay? Uh, so you grow facial hair. All right, so say we want to now invent a uh, drug that will make you grow a mustache, okay? So Obviously, testosterone has a lot of effects other than growing a mustache, so it would be uh, tough to make a drug that didn't have lots of side effects. Uh, but let's just assume that this is a, a particularly well-developed drug and it only will work on the follicles on your upper lip. Now, the idea of an agonist drug is one that acts like the ligand. Okay, So it has a area, doesn't matter what the rest of the molecule looks like, but there is one area within that molecule that looks like that area on the ligand that bound the receptor. So that now when we put the agonist into the bloodstream and it comes along to that receptor, when it finds, it also causes a conformational change and makes something happen. In this case, it makes you grow more hair on your upper lip, all right? Now, in a situation where you have both the agonist and the ligand present, so, and you're always gonna have a little bit of the natural ligand present, usually, right? Because most men have testosterone anyway. 
Uh, what that means is that the ligand might bind its receptor, yay, uh, and then it might bounce out again. Because these things are not generally permanent, right? They bind the receptor, they have their effect, effect and then they bounce out. Um, so when the ligand is having its effect and occasionally bouncing in and bouncing out, all right, it has a certain level of stimulation of those follicles. Whereas when you put the agonist in as well, now what you've got is the ligand is binding in pseudoid, but the agonist is there uh, sort of trying to nudge the, its way in, in between ligand binding. So you have way more yays happening per se. <laughs> you have way more yay happening per second than you did before. Say you have a patient who is, has a nice full mustache and they don't want to have a mustache for whatever reason. Uh, maybe they're a woman, I don't know, it doesn't matter. Um, and so you wanna develop a drug that will keep uh, the normal testosterone or androgen levels in the bloodstream from binding the receptor and causing the stimulation of the growth of the hair on the uh, upper lip. So what you can do then is you can produce, you can make a drug which is an antagonist. Now an antagonist is a little bit different than the natural ligand. Okay, so the ligand, antagonist, antagonist. Okay, the antagonist, it doesn't matter what most of the shape of the antagonist is, uh, as long as it has one part which kind of is the right shape to fit into the binding site, okay? Again, the rest of the molecule doesn't matter, it's only this sort of part that hits the receptor. Now the difference between an antagonist and an agonist one of the differences can be that an antagonist doesn't have the uh, full portion of that shape that will activate the receptor, which means that when the antagonist binds, you get no yay, there's no effect uh, of the antagonist. And what that means is, say you have uh, the ligand, which is in this case the natural hormone of testosterone, it binds, da da da, it does a yay, that's great. Then the antagonist binds and the antagonist just sits there. And while the antagonist is sitting there taking up space, the ligand can't bind. Uh, then since almost all these things are reversible processes, it'll bounce out, the ligand will bounce back in, it'll have a yay, you know, that's great, it, it made the receptor active, and then the antagonist comes along again and binds and won't allow the ligand to bind. So most antagonists are called competitive antagonists because they're competing for that binding site on the receptor, uh, and it's trying to sort of crowd out the ligand. And again, it's called a competitive antagonist because it's competing for that site. Okay, so that's really the difference between an antagonist, an agonist, and a ligand. So now let me give you another example. Uh, this is the one that's in your handout. So you remember in the video about uh, fight or flight, the girl who's being chased by the bear, she uh, is trying to run away and adrenaline has all these effects on her body that allow her to run away and survive. Uh, those are things like your heart beats fast, your blood pressure goes up, your eyes dilate, right? And one of the other things was uh, dilation of the bronchi in the lungs. Now that's mediated uh, by what's called a beta-2 adrenergic receptor. Adrenergic is adrenaline, and uh, epinephrine is the same thing as adrenaline, it's the same exact thing. Um, and so what's happening is when you're scared by a bear, your adrenal gland releases epinephrine, the sympathetic nerves release norepinephrine, and they then go throughout the bloodstream and bind different receptors in different parts of your body and have their effect. In the lungs, that is the beta-2 adrenergic receptor, okay? So let's play this game again with the cutouts. Okay. So in the normal situation, the ligand, which is epinephrine, okay, binds the receptor, and that causes the bronchi to dilate, okay? Then the ligand bounces out. If there's not a lot of epinephrine, it has its effect, and then that goes away, and then it has its effect, and such. Uh, she's being chased in the woods. She's, uh, the bear is very large and it's snarling, so lots of adrenaline's around, so that means that the receptor is getting stimulated more often because there's more of the ligand around to bind the receptor and have its effects. Now, say we have a patient with asthma, and uh, we want to increase the di dilation of the bronchi of their lungs, but we don't want to do it by chasing them around with a bear, because it's, uh, it's just not financially feasible to uh, assign a bear to every uh, patient with asthma. So instead what we do is we use an agonist. Now in this example, I'm going to use albuterol, which is a beta-2 agonist, commonly used by asthma patients. And because it's an agonist, it has a shape very similar to epinephrine. And when it binds, it also causes dilation of the bronchi, okay? Which is very nice. So now, I mean, uh, when a person is having an asthma attack, they're pretty scared. So they do have their own epinephrine. And so now what we get is that effect of now having the ligand that's there and the agonist. So now the receptor is going to be stimulated even more often. Now, if we take an asthma patient, we give them a drug that is a beta-2 antagonist or a beta-2 blocker. Um, there's lots of them around, uh, but uh, you could use any one of a lot of beta blockers like a tanolol, or I think in the, in the handout I give you propranolol, which actually binds beta-1 and beta-2 receptors. So now, let's give our asthmatic patient a beta-2 blocker, an antagonist of the beta-2 adrenergic receptor. And what that means is that while the antagonist is sitting in the receptor, the receptor is not being stimulated, which means that the bronchi of the lungs are gonna be either their normal size or they might be small, they might be even more narrow because of either asthma or something else that's stimulating um, the bronchi to constrict. There's all sorts of things like that, like that, and we'll talk about that in the lung lecture. All right, so now say I put my asthmatic patient on a beta-2 blocker for some reason, uh, and uh, she or he has an asthma attack. Well, now what's gonna happen is the normal ligand is gonna wanna try to get in there so that the bronchi can open up, but the antagonist is sitting there blocking the effect of the normal ligand. Now, again, the antagonist bounces in and out, so every now and then it'll bounce out enough that a ligand can get in and you know help with a little bit of bronchial uh, dilation. But as long as that antagonist is sitting there, uh, it's gonna be very difficult for your body to dilate those uh, bronchi. Now, I know this particular example that she's talking about has everything to do with the pulmonary system. Um, and we're talking about the nervous system, but what I, the, the point I want you to get here is when 
um, there is a ligand, there is a neurotransmitter, and there's a receptor that's shaped a certain way. And we want that neurotransmitter to bind here. The patient may be giving may be given another medication for a different disorder, a different problem that creates a problem in another part of the body or in another part of the brain. That is a very important concept to get, that we have a limited number of neurotransmitters. They are shaped uh, a certain way. The receptors for them are shaped a certain way, but the receptors in different parts of the brain are gonna respond differently to those signals but they're gonna get blocked the same way by certain medications that were intended to treat a problem over here, but they're having a consequence over here. And so this is a little bit different because we're talking about a beta blocker that might be prescribed for somebody um, who has a heart rate that's too high, um, but it's having the side effect of not allowing the patient uh, to bronchodilate during an asthma attack, but it's the same concept. Um, you've got a ligand, it has to fit in this receptor, but certain medications are gonna block the way and, and have side effects that way. Uh, so again, that's the example I gave you in the handout. And this, this works for anything, you know, any kind of neurotransmitter or hormone or chemical messenger. If you make an agonist, it's going to mimic the natural ligand. If you make an antagonist, it's gonna block the natural ligand. So pretty much all drugs that are direct acting drugs, in other words, they work through the receptor, that's what direct acting means. Um, if it's a direct acting drug, then it can only mimic the ligand or block the ligand. And that's also why you won't ever get a drug developed that causes people to have a propeller grow out of their head and then it spins around and they can fly around like a helicopter because there's no normal genes for that. There's no receptors in the body that allow you to grow a giant propeller out of your head. And so you can't, you can't do that um, with any of the drugs available today because you can only mimic or block the natural action. <laughs> so this is an example of reversible direct acting drugs, agonists and antagonists that bind the receptor for a short time and either mimic the natural ligand or block the natural ligand. And these are all reversible drugs. In other words, they don't change the receptor in some way that it can't work anymore. It just, it's just a question of interacting with that same binding site. Okay? So that's receptors, agonists, and antagonists. I'll give you a couple examples, okay? All right. So let's talk about acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds uh, receptors in the muscle and, and in the ganglia. In the autonomic nervous system, acetylcholine binds muscarinic receptors. So for example, in the heart, you have the vagus nerve, which releases acetylcholine and causes the heart rate to go down. So if acetylcholine makes your heart rate go down, what would an acetylcholine agonist do? Will it make your heart rate go up or down? That's right, it will help your heart rate go down because it's gonna act the same way as acetylcholine. What about an acetylcholine antagonist? My favorite one is uh, atropine. And atropine is a anticholinergic, it is an antagonist of acetylcholine. So when you give somebody atropine, it makes you your heart goes up, right? And in fact, you'll learn a lot about atropine because it's commonly used for lots of things, including somebody who has a slow heart rate. You give them atropine and it makes their heart be faster. All right, well, I can have some more examples in class. Uh, all right, so that's receptor binding. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Boyev.